I want to welcome you again to Christmas 2020 here, right? Oh, man, another Christmas. We're actually going to be um, in the passages in Luke chapter 2. We're going to be in those passages in Luke. It's the classic Christmas story. Well, all I can say is Merry, Merry Christmas 2020. Merry Christmas 2020. A year to remember, or for some maybe just a year to forget, right? Man, I can truly say it's like a year like none other I can ever remember being. One full of struggles and trials for so many this year, 2020. A year literally like no other. A one that was full of a lot of fear, right? A year of uncertainty and anxiety, even anger. Oh, man, how much anger have we seen throughout this year going towards this Christmas? Merry Christmas, 2020. <laughs> What's merry about it, you know? What's joyful? Where is the hope? Where is the merry? Where is the celebration in 2020? <laughs> the celebration of Christmas literally almost seems like it's been overshadowed, right? It's been overshadowed by so many things, wrapped so much even in fear and uncertainty. For many people, guys, for many people, the hope and the joy of Christmas has been wrapped up in, in literally in fear, uncertainties, fear of what will be and what will come. And many of them are alone in that too. They're literally within their homes and they're alone. And you think about these, these dear people in our, in our uh, care centers and how much of the time they've spent alone in this fear. Where's the future in that? Now, you might think right now, you're going, hey, Pastor, what is this? <laughs> you know, this is a Christmas message. It, what kind of message is this? It seems like a real downer right now where I'm going. Well, you hang on. This is Christmas Eve, you might say. A Christmas is to be of hope, joy, and peace, right? Christmas, that represents that. The birth of Jesus, the birth of that hope, joy, and peace in this world. Christmas literally represents the peace on earth and goodwill towards man, right? You're saying that's where we need to go. Has something changed, maybe? <laughs> you know, has something changed about Christmas? Is Christmas different? You know, not at all, actually. Not at all. You know, Christmas began, the first Christmas, the birth of our Savior, with aloneness, with fear, with anxiety, uncertainty in the dark, a world in turmoil, too, when our Savior was born. A world that, for many in those times, in that biblical time, there wasn't a whole lot of hope. That first Christmas, Jesus' birth, is much like today in 2020, when Jesus was born. Jesus brought the hope, do you understand? The birth of that Savior brought the hope. He brought the joy. He brought the peace. He brought the life, and he brought the future, too. Jesus really is who put Mary in Merry Christmas. He put the joy in Christmas, too. Let's pray, and I'm going to... Uh, we're going to give a message here tonight. I hope it has some hope and joy in it because I know our Savior is all about that. Father God, we just thank you again, Lord. Lord, as we gather here on this Christmas Eve, Lord, bless us with your word in this wonderful story that Luke recorded. Lord, that we might uh, leave here tonight even having a closer relationship to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So the title of my message tonight is Fear to Joy. Church, Fear to Joy. The Gospel of Luke, where we're going to be in chapter 2, is the only gospel that actually gives that Christmas story. The classic Christmas story. You know that classic Christmas story, by the way, that was read every courthouse lighting in Prescott for as long as I can remember except this year, right? We didn't have all the music on the courthouse, the lighting, and the Christmas story that was read 
every year, as far as I can remember, the story of Jesus' birth, the story of trials also in there, and fears and uncertainty, you're going to see that. You know, many times we don't think about this. You know, many prophecies spoke toward the event, what Luke captures here. Many prophecies have. I'm going to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. You don't have to turn there. I'll turn for you, okay? Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah writes, this is a prophecy hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You guys will know this one. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Isaiah writes on in verse 7, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from the time forward, even forevermore, the zeal of the Lord, the host, will perform this. Isaiah showed us the hope hundreds of years before Jesus. He showed us. He showed us this child born, a wonderful, his name would be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Hope in that. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, too. Joy, future, everlasting, everlasting hope and future in that, in those names. Isaiah's prophecy, by the way, was true and accurate. <laughs> Just so you know, it is true and accurate. A child would be all this. Jesus would be all this. Jesus, this child, will and has fulfilled, not everything, okay, has fulfilled all of this prophecy of Isaiah's. And much more, really. You know, the first Christmas, the first Christmas did not begin. That way, though, you see, as Isaiah quoted there, it didn't begin that way. It actually began in fear and uncertainty. The first Christmas, it began with, uh, with a lot of loneliness there, with a world shaken, so to speak. A life of uncertainty and fear that first Christmas when Jesus was born. Much like today. You know, people struggle, as I say, with a lot of, a lot of fear. What the future is going to bring in our world today and in our country today. What's up, coming up next? Now, the prophet Micah. Micah also speaks of Jesus' birth. He speaks of this ruler to come, an everlasting ruler also, gathering his people together as a flock, a prophecy, this prophecy of a better future, Micah, Micah speaks of, one who will be that peace, literally. I'm going to read you from Micah now. Hundreds of years prior also, before Jesus' birth, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, we read, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands in Judea or Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of his name, of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. Literally, he shall be peace. Bethlehem obviously is prophesied in here in Micah, a ruler to come out. Out of that area, that one, people will follow, it says. People will follow. One who literally is peace, too. The one to be come out of Bethlehem. You know, that might have been a little elusive, though. You think about it. Elusive for Joseph and Mary at the time. Might have been a little bit elusive for him. All alone in this situation. The fear the anxiety, 
the world they lived in in the time. Peace was kind of elusive for them. You know, Luke, we're going to begin in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. As the story goes, as Luke records, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David. And he registered with Mary, uh, and he registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, as Luke begins it. He says it came to pass, came to pass in those days. You know, I took from a commentator here, and he writes there, those were the days when the Roman Empire was really being formed as we've seen it during Jesus' time. Originally, the Roman Empire was ruled by several, several generals, literally. You know, the Roman Empire originally set up was more like a republic, believe it or not, like we have in the United States. Many in there. But it eventually moved. But gradually the power became more and more to be invested into one man. Until finally... Gaius Octavius gained control. He took the name Caesar from his uncle, Julius, Julius Caesar. By adoption, Julius had adopted this man, or this young man, I should say, as a boy. And the name Augustus then was given to him by the Roman Senate when he gained power. Now, Caesar Augustus was actually the one, uh, Rome went through many, many battles. For a long time, there was a lot of fighting in between the Rome and different countries and provinces and stuff. And Caesar Augustus, actually, when he, he came into power, kind of brought it under one. And there was a sense of peace. There wasn't these battles being fought, these wars. There was a time of peace, but he was under full rule, you see. Each and every man, woman, and child, and essentially, was a slave to Augustus. Caesar Augustus. He had full rule. The oppression of Rome was heavy, very heavy. And these census that is being taken and the taxes, you see, old Caesar Augustus, he calls that out. He makes that, he gives the command for that. Now that is only one part of the burden. Let's go back to Joseph and Mary. Only one part of that burden put upon them. And a lot upon Joseph, you think, that census and the taxes for these couple. And Joseph had another concern also, right? He had a great another concern. He had to travel all the way to Bethlehem from Nazareth with, by the way, a very pregnant wife named Mary. Nine months pregnant, ready to give birth. A long journey. 80 miles, could you imagine that? 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. By the way, there were no buses. There were no planes to shoot you over there, you know. It would have been walking or maybe she might have even rode on a donkey. But 80 miles, anybody's ever been to Israel, it's not, um, it's rough country. Let's put it that way. It's very rough there. Long journey. Joseph had quite concerns here. Alone, too. Anxious. Anxious. Fear of the unknown. What's going to take place? I have to go there. Would they be okay? Think about, think about that couple, where they're at in that time. And they have to make this journey. Would they be okay? How about Mary's child? Mary's child, will it be okay making this journey? Where to stay? I don't even know that, you know. Where are we going to stay? How would they survive? The worries, the stress, the anxieties, and the fear in that time. You see, not a lot different. Not a whole lot different. Sounds like the Christmas of 2020. The fear of the unknown, right? That's probably the greatest fear, is that fear of the unknown. The anxieties and stress. What lays ahead? 
what lays ahead for you into next year, for the future, right? The fear of the unknown, the worry, the anxiety. I'm going to read to you one of my favorite scriptures, one of my very favorite scriptures, church, because I use this so often. As Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, be anxious for nothing, worry about nothing. And man, if you can grab on to this. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with, I'm going to add a word, great thanksgiving. Right? He says thanksgiving. I'm saying great thanksgiving. We have so much to be thankful for. Think about it. We have so much, so much. He says, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen? Man, how many times I use Paul, what he says to do. Thank God for his word. You know, though Joseph didn't have that part, he didn't have the New Testament, and neither did Mary, but we do. In verse 4, as we read here in Luke, Joseph, it said, was being of the house of David. The house of David. So he literally had to go to Bethlehem, which used to, was the city of David, to be registered. By the way, I'm not going to go into the whole lineage of it, but Mary also was of the house of David. Do you understand? They were both from that house and from different lines, Mary and Joseph. As a married couple, they fulfill prophecy pretty amazingly. King David. King David was told of this prophecy. You guys, if you were here with me when we studied 2 Samuel, we read about this. God's promise as he gave it to David. It'll be on the screen. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled, he's speaking to David, King David, and you rest with your fathers, he says, die, I will set up your seed after you who will come uh, from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, literally, this was a double prophecy. This was a prophecy towards Solomon plus a prophecy towards Jesus. In verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever, amen. You see, this journey, this journey for Joseph and Mary, guys, it was very inconvenient. You think about it. Oh, so inconvenient, bad timing, but it had to take place. They were commanded this. There was no way around not going on this journey. You know, with you ladies here, and any of you who have had children, could you imagine at 12 months pregnant traveling this journey, right? <laughs> Poor Joseph, you know, but could you imagine that, traveling that journey? Not sure also, really not sure of what's going to take place, what the future is going to be also for, for, for Mary herself. The anxiety again, the fear, what next? There again, 2020, the Christmas of 2020. We've seen it so much in our, in our land. In verse 6, as we read on, Luke says, So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. By the way, the swaddling clothes, most commentators say, it's just torn rags or, or torn up clothes, and then the child's wrapped up in that. In swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn, it says. Now, Luke writes it very simply. You know me. I go a little deeper. He writes it very simply in the fact that she brought forth this child, right? Birth this child. That's the story we all know. Mary birthed this child, brought her forth. Mary giving birth to this child, just very simply, right? Very simply. Looking deeper, as we read Luke here, Mary delivered this child alone. Alone. 
by herself. Now, Joseph, her husband, would have been there. But Mary didn't have, you know, a doctor there or a nurse or a midwife. She delivered this alone. Alone and really scared, I would imagine, too, you know. No help, no house to be in, no room to go to. Alone in a stable or a barn. Most likely, actually, was a cave. It was a cave that was used to keep animals in. Mary delivered this baby alone. Now, Mary was very young, too. Mary was probably only 16 or 17 years old when she birthed Jesus. Her first child, obviously, a virgin, a virgin who brought forth Jesus. This was her first child alone. Man, could you imagine? There was no room for Jesus, you know, in the inn, as Luke writes here. No room for Jesus then. You know, I thought about that, how true it is today. And there's so many people's hearts. There's no room for Jesus today either. There's no room in those hardened hearts. I was one of those people. I had no need for Jesus. I had no need for God. Back then, there was literally not even a room for him, for Jesus. If you were God, Let's just put it this way. If you were God, where would your son be born? I mean, think about it. If you were God, where would your son be born? In a stable? Oh, I think not. I highly doubt it. If I was God, my son, he'd be born in a mansion, man, with everything he needed. Everything for that mother of the son would be taken care of. No way would he be born in a stable. He'd have nurses and doctors, the best of everything, right? By all means. God chose, you see, God chose very humble beginnings for Jesus. Why? I'll tell you why. That we all could relate. That we could relate to those humble beginnings. Why was Caesar's decree right now? You know, you think about it. <laughs> Why did Caesar's decree happen right here when Mary is just about ready to have her child anyway at the nine-month mark? Why was it now? God chose them. God was in control, too. Never forget that, church. Never forget God is in control. God's word, by the way, already spoke it 700 years prior. It would be in Bethlehem, there in Nazareth. Why was that decree? God had a little work to do. He had to get him from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You know, it didn't take him by surprise by any means. But it was already said in Micah 5.2 as I would read that. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, who's going forth and from, from old, from everlasting. It was already prophesied, you see. God already knew. Man, God was in control. Mary was not alone, by the way. And she had more than just Joseph there. Mary wasn't alone. Mary had no reason for fear. Though she might have felt it, God was there. God was in control. Jesus would be born. He would be born and everything would be fine. God was in control. Do we understand that for Christmas 2020? Do we understand that in our nation, in our land, in our world? Just as then, that very first Christmas, so today in 2020, God is here. Oh, we might look around and go, really? Yes, God is here. He's in control. No fear, no anxiety, no worries need to go out there. God is still in control and always will be. You know, peace, joy, and contentment, this is what we, we should have as Christians, as believers, knowing, knowing our Lord and knowing that his hand is upon our lives. And by the way, upon nations. You know, King David, going back to King David again, I want to read you from Psalm 139. Such an, such an awesome thing because King David knew. He knew his God, 
And he knew his God was on top of everything. King David had no, no worries, you know. Oh, King David failed in many ways, but he knew his God. In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 1, he writes, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And you are acquainted with all my ways. David knew. God's in there. God was there. He says, for there is not a word on my tongue even. But behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. You've covered it from before where I'm going to get there. And by the way, you're bringing up the back too, Lord. David knew it. God is in control, church. He says, you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Oh, yeah, I'm with David. I can't attain it. He then says, goes on to say, where can I go? He almost gets kind of Oh, I don't even know the word I want to use. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there, Lord. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of a morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall be, lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you. God, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. God is in control. Christmas 2020. God is still in control. Amen. Now God now assures this couple as we go on in this story. He assures them, by the way, they're not alone. And there's no reason for fear. You know, I am. God, he's going to show them. I am. Back to Luke. In verse 8, we continue on. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Yeah, I guess so. The glory of the Lord came upon them. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, but for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, just as it is. And suddenly there was an, uh, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and and on earth and peace and good will towards men. So God sends an angel. God sends this angel. And to send the news. And he sends the news to this shepherds. To the shepherds. Now many might ask, which angel? You know, you might want to say, well, which angel was it? Personally, I think it was Gabriel. I believe it was Gabriel. Why? We know he can't keep a secret anyway. Gabriel cannot keep a secret, man. And Gabriel was involved from the get-go with Mary and Joseph. And so, actually, I'll turn here to chapter 1 in verse 26. When Gabriel, he came to Mary. He can't keep a secret. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to be a uh, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when he saw him, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son who shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary, now she said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? She's never laid with a man. 
And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Immaculate conception. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. I believe, I believe it was Gabriel by any means. Now this angel, we're going to call him Gabriel, spreads the news again. In verse 8 he says, Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, this angel of the Lord stood before them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they now were greatly afraid. We see fear again, the very first Christmas. We see it in these shepherds. These shepherds were fearful of what was taking place. You know, the shepherds, the shepherds were the lowest of the low. In society, they were the lowest class of humanity, were these shepherds, by the way. Hmm. Filthy, stinky. They didn't go hang out in town. Nobody wanted the shepherds around. You stay out there in the field, you know. You stay out in the field. They were the lowest class of humanity. They must have been thinking, why us? They're out in the field. Maybe they got a little campfire going. They're watching over their sheep, and all of a sudden, bam, there come Gabriel and a host of angels. Why us? Why did God tell us first? Why is he telling us? The birth of Christ, the Savior, to these filthy shepherds out there. There again, I believe God wanted the humble to know first. The downtrodden to be lifted up. Those shepherds were downtrodden by society. To break their aloneness too out there in the field. To come to Jesus and break his aloneness, even as a baby, right? Take rest. Take rest from the fear and the anxiety and the worries and the aloneness that they were feeling. And this couple feeling. You know, Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, I love this scripture where Jesus just says, Come to me. Come to me. All of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come, right? He just says, Come to me, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light man you got anxiety you got any fears you got to wonder what's going to take place next come to me jesus says are you burdened come to me christmas 2020 a time it needs to be a time of giving our burdens and turning fear into joy. Giving our burdens over the Lord. Any fear, turn it into joy. Coming to Jesus humbly like these shepherds. See, these shepherds are going to go there. They're going to go and see this child, the Son of God. There no not need be any fear, but joy. Turn that fear to joy. Guys, the world today, man, I watch too much news. <laughs> I really do. I turn it off. Click. The world today needs the Christmas of then, too. They need that Jesus, right? The world today, they need the joy of Jesus, the Son of God, born as a baby. In verse 15, we read on. Oh, we better read on. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into the heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Hey, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord, by the way, has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. As quick as they could, they found them. Hmm. Can you imagine Joseph? Hey, honey, we have visitors. <laughs> you know, 
Think about it. They're alone. They're, we're not alone anymore. Here come these shepherds. Man, we got some visitors, honey. Bringing joy to Mary and Joseph, too. You know, so many times you see the nativity scene, and there's Joseph. He does it like this. Mary's on her knees. So solemn. Really? Really so solemn? Boy, when those shepherds walked in there, I bet that big old smile went on their face. Mary said, look at me here. This beautiful baby. Joseph, he's a proud father, man. You know, sometimes we want to we wanna make things so solemn in those times. No. Hey, honey, we have some visitors here. We're not alone. Bringing that joy in there. Those shepherds visiting. Boy, that had to be an uplift for this couple right now. People like us, too, right? Joseph and Mary came very simple, very humble beginnings. People like us, humble. And by the way, they were lonely, too, those shepherds. People just like us, visiting, visiting us, and visiting Jesus. You know, church, there's, there's a lot of lonely people out there. There really is. There's a whole lot of lonely people within our community right here. Go visit them. By the way, take Jesus with you. Visit them with Jesus. Call them up on the phone if you must. You know, I don't care if you got to put a mask on to walk in their house. Okay. I was talking to a gentleman tonight, hadn't seen the couple in a while, and she's going to be having surgery, so they haven't been coming to church. I said, I'm going to come see you next week. I said, do you want me to wear a mask? He said, no, Pastor, don't worry about it. I said, okay, I'm going to come see you. Go visit those lonely ones out there, guys. And maybe they don't come to this church. That's okay. That's even better. That's even better. And take Jesus with you. Give them some joy. In verse 15, Luke writes, So it was when the angels had gone away from the, uh, them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which, by the way, the Lord has made known to us. The Lord made known to these shepherds, right? Which the Lord has made known. Let us go. Let us see what's all the ruckus about. The Lord made it known to us. Let us go see first that he has shown us that that we know. Seek out, seek out what has been made known to you. Where am I going? Seek your Lord. Seek your Lord. What has been made known to you? Have an understanding for yourself. Not only the child, the baby Jesus, but the Jesus, the Jesus who took the sacrifice, took the nails, took the beating. No, Jesus, no, your Lord. He wants you to seek him out, have an understanding. You know, Jesus included that. You guys have been with me on Sundays, and I really enjoyed teaching the gospel of John. And, and Jesus included that in his prayer. In John 17, 3, he said, and this is eternal life, as he's praying to the Father, that they may know you, the only true God. No, Konosko, experience your Lord, you see. Experience your Lord. He will reveal himself greater and greater and greater if you only seek him. They may own uh, the true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You know, Paul Paul, the Apostle Paul, he had an extreme desire to know his Lord. I mean, to the utmost. Literally, I don't know if I could go that far. I pray I could be like the Apostle Paul. But he had this desire to know his Lord and everything about him and everything that took place. In Philippians 3.10, it will be on the screen. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. By the way, you can know the power of his resurrection. How? By the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the tomb is the same Spirit He has given to live within each and every believer. Do you understand that? To know the power of His resurrection. No, we don't have the power of God. Don't get me wrong there, but the fact of the matter, the Holy Spirit within us, to know the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. His sufferings. Being conformed, literally, to his death. Oh, man. Paul wanted to know that. He wanted to know 
the sacrifice of Jesus in his own life. Like I say, I want that for myself, but can I? Can I sacrifice in this community, loving others like Jesus loved? Can conform to his death. See, Jesus as a baby was made known, right, to these shepherds. Jesus as God needs to be sought, church. He needs to be sought and seeked out. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek the kingdom, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. Now, Jesus had just went through a teaching of, hey, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about where you're going to find shelter. He said, don't worry about any of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Where is the anxiety in that? Where is the fear in that? Where's 2020 in that one, right? In verse 17, now, when they had... Um, when they had seen him, they made now widely known. These are the shepherds. They made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by these shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart, it says. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And as it was told them, who, it says. <laughs> Christmas 2020. A year to remember, church. A year we need to remember. A time to make widely known as they did. Jesus within our community. Jesus to your family. Jesus to your friends. Jesus to your co-workers. To make him widely known. Turn their Fear into joy, you see. This is a year we need to remember. It's a year that I believe the church needed to step up and turn that fear into joy. See, these shepherds only knew a little, right? They were only knew what was told them. In verse 17 there, it says, Now they had seen him and they, were, and, and they made widely known the sayings which was told them. Concerning this child, they only knew just a little bit. They didn't know it all, right? They only knew what was told them there, what they knew. In Luke 2.11, we just read this. For there is born to you, the angel said, this day in city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's all they knew. You know, that's all they said. That's all they spoke. This news surpassed all the fear and anxieties and aloneness to anybody they spoke it to, you understand? Because it brought great joy. It turned that fear into joy, whoever they spoke it. The Savior was born. The Savior has lived. The Messiah has come, right? That was enough for them. That's all they needed. God had given them hope. had given them a Savior. They only knew a little bit, right? Guys, you know the rest of the story. Do you understand? You know the rest. You know so much more. They didn't know this Savior would die upon a cross, give himself for their lives, for their eternal lives. They didn't know that, but they just knew there was a Savior born, and they gave that out there. You know the rest of the story. You know, Jesus is a baby. He turned fear into joy. Heartaches into hope in this story here with Joseph, with Mary, with these shepherds, and of course anybody else that the shepherds talked to. And Jesus as a baby comforted the hearts of the shepherds knowing, man, there's a Savior. What peace it must have given them. It had to have given them this peace. And then, but see, Jesus didn't stay that baby, did he? No, Jesus, he grew up to be a man. By the way, he lived a sinless life without sin, always pleasing the Father, lived a sinless life, taught many when his ministry began, 
you know, we've been studying the gospel of John. He taught thousands at a time. He taught his disciples, did many miracles. He healed the blind, raised the dead even, caused the crippled to be able to get up and walk. He did all these things. And then he was denied. He was denied. He was beaten. He was mocked. Suffered the death upon the Roman cross. Why? For you. For me. For all mankind. Why did Jesus suffer and die for you and me? To turn that fear to joy, guys. To turn any of our fear to joy, do you see? Anything in our lives. To turn fear to joy. To turn the hurt into healing in our lives. Whatever the hurt is. Give it to the Lord. To put the Mary in Christmas, amen? To put that Mary in Christmas. You know, Christmas 2020, this Christmas, right now, should even be more special than any other Christmas. Why? Jesus still lives, church. And he lives in you. He lives in me. We have a risen Savior, a live Savior. Jesus still lives, and Jesus is still, he's still turning that fear to joy. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you for this Christmas Eve. Father, God, you have, you have shown us through your word. Lord, you have shown us through your word that, God, you turn that fear into joy. You work in our hearts, Lord. Lord, let us go out this evening after the final time of worship. Let us go out, Lord, and share what we know you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.